Ladies and gentlemen, if I could have your attention. Uh, sorry to keep you waiting, but uh, because this is being streamed upstairs uh, and because it's being um, streamed worldwide, of course, uh, we have to be punctual. It's now 15.30. Uh, so uh, welcome. My name's Geoffrey Don. I'm director of the uh, Flora Institute. Uh, welcome to the Kenneth Meyer Lecture for 2013. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the presence of Mr. Martin Ma, son of uh, Ken Ma. I'm starting the lecture here. Uh, Ken Ma, who was the, uh, one of the founding uh, influences on the Florey, uh, together with Ian Potter. Derek Denton, uh, the founding director. Fred Mendelson, previous director. Charles and Jocelyn Allen. Charles was a previous chair of the board. Uh, so welcome to what is the uh, 17th uh, of these lectures and it's been very appropriate uh, that I think it's for the first time in the Kenneth Meyer building uh, named uh, after uh, Martin's father and also the auditorium which those of you were here earlier uh, freshly named this afternoon uh, the Ian Potter Auditorium. And as I said, these two individuals were, uh, together with Derek Denton, responsible for uh, the foundation of the Florey Institute now, uh, some 50 years ago. Uh, so this lecture has always been given by someone who has made a seminal contribution to science uh, or someone who's made a seminal contribution to communication of science uh, to the public, as we had last year. Uh, this year is no exception. We have uh, Professor Carl Dieseroth, who's known to many of you, uh, who's already attacked, uh, attracted a lot of attention worldwide. He's, in fact, one of the youngest uh, lecturers we've had, uh, but in this very short time, he's had a significant impact all around the world. He's uh, the D.H. Chen Professor of Bioengineering and Psychiatry at Stanford University. He did his undergraduate degree at Harvard, uh, then MD, PhD at Stanford, and is a practicing psychiatrist. And perhaps that's where he's got some of his insight into these remarkable uh, discoveries he's made. Of course, he's been best known for the development of optogenetics uh, and latterly the clarity system, enabling the image uh, of intact biological systems uh, for the first time. He's received numerous prizes. Uh, I won't go through them all, but merely to say that in 2013 alone, uh, the Pazaroff Prize, the Brain Prize, and the Lounsbury Prize. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, if you'd join with me in welcoming Carl Dizaroff to, delect, uh, to deliver this lecture. <laughs> Thank you uh, very much uh, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a beautiful building. Uh, I have friends and colleagues here uh, and look forward to, to sharing our work and, and hearing your thoughts. Uh, I actually, there's a lot I wanted to, to share and what I might do, uh, I will allow, uh, if it's okay with you, some time for questions at the end. So I might skip some slides in order to allow a little conversation at the end. So uh, what my uh, work is focused on is trying to understand the, uh, the dynamics of intact systems, the structure and the dynamics, and how this works and how it fails to work in uh, disease states. Of course, uh, in psychiatry, we have a special problem. We don't know the right scale at which we need to look to see what the normal or the pathological processes are. Uh, there are so many mysteries that uh, we have a long way to go. The need, though, is great, as you all appreciate. Uh, we know that, as the red pie slices here show, that the fraction of worldwide disability that's attributable to psychiatric disease is very high. Uh, but the complexity of the uh, human brain is, is very great. The approach we've taken is uh, to use light uh, in various ways to study specific cell types within the brain, looking at the cell activity patterns that cause or control behavior. And, and uh, these insights to understand uh, normal and pathological uh, uh, dynamics. Now, one uh, approach we've taken is uh, uh, we call clarity. This is a way of looking at the intact brain uh, without disassembly and visualizing the three-dimensional arrangements of cells and projections. 
Another approach we've taken is something called optogenetics, where we uh, are able to introduce uh, a panel of light-activated regulators of transmembrane ion flow into animals, into particular cell types or circuit elements within the brain, and uh, track complex behaviors uh, while we're exerting this uh, precise control. So I'll tell you about the basic technology and recent uh, advances on both of these fronts. And uh, I'll start with uh, clarity. So this had a, a very uh, uh, unexpected uh, origin in my laboratory. It actually started with uh, thinking about moth wings. Uh, and this was an uh, uh, idea I had some years back where I wanted to build in place within the brain a durable infrastructure. I wanted to instruct uh, neurons to build a, a polymers, a, uh, an endoskeleton, as it were, within uh, themselves uh, that would be uh, visible, tractable, studyable after the rest of the brain had been uh, removed or cleared. And so we were thinking about ways to introduce uh, uh, genes that would instruct neurons uh, to build such durable infrastructure from within themselves. And I had a few thoughts. One was to instruct them to build a uh, chitin, which is a, a biopolymer. Uh, it's present throughout the animal kingdom. Uh, what got me interested in this was that the monomer uh, that uh, gives rise to chitin uh, is actually present in neurons. It's present for different reasons, but this uh, simple uh, sh uh, sugar is present in mammalian neurons, and so I thought all you would need would be a chitinase that would help the polymerization of this uh, uh, to happen. And so we uh, set up a little uh, 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 side facility at Stanford. Uh, there's this a little uh, place on the hill. It's about a half mile from my regular laboratory. And we got a small group working on this uh, uh, unusual project. And we looked at chitin, we looked at cellulose, actually, related question. If we introduced a cellulase, could we uh, instruct neurons to actually build a cellulose from within themselves? Uh, we looked at keratins, uh, uh, durable uh, uh, proteins that are present in, uh, in uh, for example, our hair and, and uh, nails. And uh, actually, this sort of started to work. This, this part's not published yet. Um, but what we found is we could, uh, for example, introduce uh, keratins, keratin 18 or keratin 8. Either one of these by themselves will not form polymers. This is uh, known, will not form durable filaments. Uh, however, if you introduce both 8 and 18 together, you will, as this YFP label uh, shows, the neuron actually will produce uh, keratin uh, filaments and that will fill the processes of the neuron. And you can actually then hypotonically lyse the neuron, kill it, kill everything around it, but the physical form of the neuron is maintained and is persistent. And that's not something you see if you have uh, just a neuron filled with a fluorescent protein that's soluble like M. cherry. If you carry out a hypotonic lysis, you'll disrupt it and no longer see its structure. So that was in culture. We then uh, took this into uh, uh, a more three-dimensional arrangement. We did this sort of thing. In, uh, uh, here we started to bring in some chemical engineering uh, tools and we built uh, uh, three-dimensional uh, collagen uh, cubes and seeded neurons and, and astroglia within this uh, cube and instructed the neurons to build uh, these uh, keratin filaments within themselves. And again, the structures were durable. And then we actually brought this to the mammalian brain. Again, this is not published yet. And we found we could uh, introduce the keratins and have the neurons build this uh, durable uh, uh, endoskeleton within themselves. So the next step was then to uh, remove the uh, surrounding tissue so we could study the form of this uh, endoskeleton in greater detail. And the idea would be we would then uh, come and uh, uh, target this endoskeleton to different kinds of cells or to multiple uh, different kinds of cells in the same preparation. But of course, we had to build a, uh, a structure uh, to support this uh, uh, new endoskeleton. So we began experimenting with hydrogels, transparent uh, networks of three-dimensional hydrophilic uh, polymers. And that started to work too. And then uh, actually that started to work so well that we found we didn't actually need the endoskeleton at all. And so this actually led to clarity where all we did is build this sort of exoskeleton. We didn't have the neurons uh, making keratin or chitin at all. So it was an interesting uh, scientific journey. The end result being this, which is a uh, brain that was never sectioned. This is a mouse. Uh, brain where the label is uh, a yellow fluorescent protein expressed in long-range projection neurons. 
uh, of the thigh one type. And here we're flying over the CA1 layer of the hippocampus, for example, and we can see the three-dimensional arrangements of the cells and the connections. Again, this is not uh, a brain that's been taken apart or reassembled. This is actually the brain in its intact state. Uh, you can see here now in cortex uh, the array of layer 5 neurons and their apical dendrites extending up to the peel uh, surface. So this uh, was achieved uh, in the following way. The process looks a little bit like this. You can start with a mouse brain that's not transparent, and after uh, uh, a couple days of the clearing process, uh, you can actually make it transparent, so you can actually read text through it. Uh, other groups have worked on making brains transparent, uh, partially uh, uh, at least, uh, although they tend to be a little slower. And the main advantage of clarity that we have found is, is, is not only the increased transparency, but also that we can label uh, the uh, components with uh, antibodies and macromolecules, and I'll show you uh, how that works. So this is the uh, physical principle behind uh, clarity. What we do is we take a intact uh, brain, and before uh, we do anything else, we build this exoskeleton in place, and we do that by first infusing um, uh, fixatives uh, uh, and uh, the monomers of the hydrogel. So this includes for example, uh, acrylamide, bisacrylamide, and thermally triggered initiators of polymerization along with formaldehyde crosslinkers. But that's done in the cold, so the polymerization doesn't happen. There are just monomers that are present throughout the uh, tissue. Then we elevate the temperature, and that triggers uh, more or less simultaneously from uh, everywhere within the tissue a uh, hydrogel creation process that uh, Crosslinks all the biomolecules uh, that uh, have uh, amide reactive groups, proteins, uh, and uh, in this case also nucleic acids together into this uh, meshwork uh, that's shown in light blue here. Uh, lipids, though, like the phospholipid membranes, uh, tend to be spared by this process. They don't become crosslinked and embedded within the network, which is good. The phospholipid membranes are the main cause of light scattering that lead to the opacity of brain tissue. The refractive index changes at the lipid aqueous interface as being the main culprit. Those are also, of course, the barriers to macromolecule penetration for staining. Having built this in place, we can then remove the lipids. Uh, we can do that with very stringent detergents like uh, the ionic, strong ionic detergent, SDS, and we can, moreover, actively clear these uh, 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 lipid containing my cells using uh, electrophoresis. So effectively, we, we turn the brain into an acrylamide gel and then electrophoresis. So it's a little bit like molecular biology, except you're doing it with a brain. And we build little uh, uh, electrophoresis chambers, which uh, facilitate this process. Uh, uh, the imposition of the electric field across the, the brain accelerates the, the clearing. Uh, the end result is you can actually do labeling as well. You can see, for example, staining for even a single amino acid neurotransmitter, GABA, and co-staining for other molecular markers like parvalbumin in this case. You can also do in situ hybridization for uh, nucleic acid targets. In this case, it's a D2 type dopamine receptor in situ hybridization with a uh, short oligomer uh, probe that picks up about half of the cells as expected in striatum. Uh, where blue is the DAPI label for all nuclei and red is the D2 dopamine receptor in situ hybridization. Now, this works in human tissue, and this was a, a, an important consideration in the development. We wanted to be able to extract out uh, structural and, and molecular information from uh, uh, non-sectioned uh, brain bank samples. What's shown here is uh, a sample from brain area 10 of a human uh, sample, a donated brain, uh, in this case actually a seven-year-old uh, child with autism, uh, and this highlights the need to uh, uh, extract the most useful information that we can from some of these uh, very precious samples. But we can stain from multiple different markers. These are axons uh, that happen to be of the uh, parvalbumin expressing type coated with myelin basic protein. You can actually do long-range uh, tracking of axons. All of these are axons here. This is a neurofilament. Uh, antibody labeling in this unsectioned uh, human uh, tissue. Back to mouse, this is a mouse hippocampus now with multiple of these labels all uh, done together in the same 
uh, tissue. Now, the, um, of course, there's this issue of the ease uh, of not having to section uh, and try to reconstruct. Of course, that's slow and tedious and damaging. Uh, but having the confidence of the three-dimensional uh, relationships and the joint statistics that you have uh, from this single intact preparation are potentially valuable. And I think uh, another potential value might be registering this sort of data set with other kinds of data sets. For example, doing activity imaging with genetically encoded calcium indicators and then registering that sort of activity data set which could be acquired during behavior with this sort of uh, anatomical and molecular uh, a data set that can be extracted from the same animal after uh, sacrifice. Now one question might be uh, how dense a label can you use? Uh, uh, and here you're limited only by the limitations of light microscopy, uh, which are substantial. Uh, but this is a uh, MAP2 uh, label in dense neuropil. MAP2 labels essentially all the dendrites. And here uh, uh, you can see in this clarified tissue, the green is the MAP2 label. If you look at the whole block of uh, tissue, it just looks like a dense uh, a block of, uh, of green. But if you've taken the, the time to image at high resolution with uh, the right objective and the right uh, scope, you actually have all the information there. And you can look at the arrangements of dendrites and track the branching and, and interrelationships within this uh, tissue. Of course, light microscopy has its limits. You, you uh, uh, have uh, uh, fundamental issues that are only fully resolved by electron microscopy. Now, this is a, uh, it's, it's an unusual sort of thing to do, and so building the intuition for how to do it well uh, takes a, a few tries. Um, it took us about 100 or so tries, and, but it t uh, we're trying to help people to get them through that faster, and so we have an online uh, resources, clarityresourcecenter.org, and there's a forum where people have been posting uh, uh, thoughts and ideas and their part numbers uh, and so on uh, for, for putting together this, this system. And people are, you know, posting their cleared brains. Actually, uh, uh, you uh, have it working here at your institute, uh, as uh, Steve's lab has shown, but uh, people are posting uh, their uh, cleared brains. Here's something from Sheena Jocelyn's group. Uh, she used a quote from H.G. Wells, The Invisible Man, and put her cleared mouse brain over that. And then uh, this is sort of <laughs> before and after. Um, sometimes you don't know the names. This is, uh, I only know this person as Fabio. He's a, one of our forum users. Maybe it's the Fabio. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but he's got his brain pretty clear. So people have it working pretty well, but there are still problems. Uh, and the, the main problems I think are addressable, but it's a very early stage technology. It's actually a little reminiscent of the first year or two after our first optogenetics work, where uh, there were two things going on. A lot of laboratories trying to encompass this new kind of, uh, of, of technology and having some fits and starts and getting it going. But then there were fundamental things that had to be solved separate from that. With optogenetics, it was figuring out how to target the opsins, both within a cell and particular kinds of cell, and I'll tell you about that shortly. With Clarity, the uh, technological challenges are, are solvable, but they have to do with designing and building longer working distance objectives. Uh, all the major microscope manufacturers are building and actually have already built Clarity uh, objectives uh, that uh, they're going to be making available in the coming few months. We're trying to speed up uh, the process, uh, the clarifying, the staining, and the imaging. Uh, and then, of course, you've got these huge data sets that you have to analyze in some way. You have to segment the anatomical features. You have to uh, quantify uh, the resulting segmented features. And so it's a big data problem. It's a computational problem. This is, of course, common to uh, any uh, large-scale anatomy. Um, before we go on, I'll just dwell for a moment on this uh, interesting concept. The fact that you can do this is sort of interesting. If you can you know, build in this exoskeleton, and if you can introduce macromolecules into it, what else could you do? Uh, you, know, the, the, you, could do you could build different kinds of gels. You could have uh, not just passive gels, but conducting gels. And we're working on uh, building conducting polymers so we could actually start to uh, do some active interrogation of the system. Uh, as one other example, you know, you could introduce, uh, if you can introduce antibodies, you could introduce other kinds of 
uh, proteins, enzymes, uh, polymerases, you could actually start to think about doing a high content uh, RNA-seq and, and uh, uh, get transcriptomic uh, information out, perhaps on a cell-by-cell -cell basis. So a lot of interesting possibilities, um, uh, and there are different uh, avenues that we're working on while we're also trying to speed up the fundamentals. But I think the most immediate interesting thing is to take these sorts of data sets, and this is a mouse brain, sort of five by six by eight millimeters, and to start to, to register this data set with other kinds of things. You know, for example, you, there's a very characteristic three-dimensional arrangement of these cells that you can now see and be confident of because of the intactness of the preparation. And as I alluded to earlier, if you had, and we're starting to do this and other groups are doing this, if you're working on activity imaging with genetically encoded calcium indicators, as is illustrated here, uh, this is in mammalian cortex, GCAMP3 is the activity indicator here, but you can see, again, the same sort of three-dimensional arrangement using the right imaging uh, modality uh, of the cells, and what we're doing is now working on ways of registering this data set with the Clarity data set, so you could uh, uh, infer uh, directly uh, what these particular cells that had a known activity pattern during a behavior then in that same animal to then see the local and global wiring and molecular phenotype of those cells. So I think that's maybe the most immediate interesting uh, opportunity. And so that sort of uh, leads into uh, uh, the optogenetics aspect, which is uh, the next uh, uh, topic, where you might have not only imaged the activity of some cells, but also causally controlled them in that same animal during behavior. So you would actually know not only what they were doing, but what they were important for in that same animal before getting the, the wiring information. So this is uh, the essence of optogenetics. Uh, I won't spend too much time on the background, uh, but the essence of it is essentially this, uh, conferring light sensitivity to particular kinds of cells that are genetically targeted and then bathing the tissue in light, thereby overcoming the main limitation of electrodes, which is they cannot resolve different cells that do different things that might be next to each other. And the way we uh, do this is we introduce uh, single component light activated regulators of ion flow that we borrow from microbes of various kinds. In 2004, we found that we could flash blue light pulses and elicit action potentials in culture using this protein, a uh, channel rhodopsin, a cation channel uh, that is borrowed from Chlamydomonas reinhardii, the single celled green algae. Now, that was you know, as I mentioned early on, that was just a culture. A lot of people said, well, that's, that's kind of nice, but uh, is it really going to be useful uh, in uh, any kind of actual uh, real world situation? Um, and it actually took a number of years to sort that out and make it work. Uh, but by 2007, we were able to uh, introduce channel rhodopsin into uh, targeted subsets of neurons in a lateral hypothalamus build fiber optic interfaces that allowed us to play in patterns of activity deep into the brain and, in this case, study the behavioral state transition of uh, awakening and the causal neural codes that underlie that, underlie that process. We uh, also have delved deeper into the opsins themselves, and we've done a lot of engineering of the opsins for enhanced uh, or different uh, properties. One of the most exciting things. I actually trained from my very early days as a biochemist, uh, uh, first as an undergraduate, and so I uh, was very excited that we were finally were able to come to the crystal structure of channel rhodopsin. It was quite mysterious how a seven transmembrane opsin, as this is, could form a pore or a channel and actually uh, uh, stirred quite a bit of controversy in the field. But this is what it looks like. It's a, it's a beautiful uh, protein. It has two seven transmembrane uh, uh, components that form a covalently linked dimer. Uh, and here's what it looks like end on. There is not, as many people had thought, a pore that's formed at the interface of the two monomers. Instead, each monomer has its own pore. Uh, this magenta structure is all transretinal, which is a vitamin A-like cofactor that actually receives the photon and has a conformational change that then opens the pore. And having detailed information about everything that's near the all transretinal, the position of all the residues at uh, 2.3 angstrom resolution has 
opened up a, a great deal of opportunities for tuning the properties of these opsins, spectrally, kinetically, and with regard to ion selectivity. And I'm going to show some examples in the context of applications to uh, freely moving mammals. So one of the first modifications that we made was to this residue, this cysteine-128, which comes near the all-trans retinal. That, or modifying this aspartate-156, or the two of them together, creates a bistable-like property. Normally, when you turn off the light, the photocurrent, as illustrated here, turns off quite rapidly with a time constant of about 10 to 12 milliseconds. But mutations in either of these residues uh, greatly slow the deactivation, uh, so much so that it barely turns off at all. Now, that has a couple interesting properties. Uh, first, uh, it makes the cells expressing the opsins more light sensitive, and that's because uh, for long light pulses, the opsins don't turn off and the cell becomes like a photon integrator and will integrate even weak uh, light levels up uh, to create high levels of photocurrent over time. And so you can get very large volumes of tissue maximally recruited uh, using these very light sensitive opsins. The other advantage is you just have to give a single light pulse and then you can actually remove your fiber optic and you can have an animal that's behaving freely even while it, your target population has been photosensitized. You can still turn it off with a different color of light, it turns out. So this is a very simplified photocycle. The opsins start from a dark closed state, the so-called D470 state. They absorb a blue photon and go through some metastable intermediates. This is the open state, the P520 state, in which these uh, bistable or step function opsins are stuck. But you can actually shortcut them back to the dark state with a green or yellow photon. So you still have high temporal resolution control, but you have bistable properties. And that turned out to be useful in the following application. What we did was we wanted to shift the balance of excitation and inhibition in the prefrontal cortex of freely moving mice in the context of social behavior, interacting with conspecifics. Now normally mice, even a same gender juvenile mouse, they will find interesting, motivating to explore. Uh, but it had been and still is hypothesized in the uh, autism literature that, and this is in part due to epidemiological and genetic evidence as well as physiological evidence, that there might be an elevated excitation to inhibition balance issue in individuals with uh, autism. There's a, and, and this could, if it were causal, perhaps be of interest in understanding autism. Now this is the problem though, of course, with genetics is you can see correlations and they may be caused by the gene, but you don't know that the physiology is causal in the dysfunction. Uh, the physiology that results might be compensatory in some sense. And so to cause a physiological change and then to see a behavior was uh, of interest. So what we did was introduce one of these step function opsins into the excitatory cells of prefrontal cortex of freely moving mice to see what happens with this causal physiology change acutely. Is there a change in social uh, function? And we did that uh, using this promoter fragment, the cam kinase 2 alpha promoter, packaging everything into a, a, a viral vector that we could then introduce into prefrontal cortex along with a removable laser, capitalizing on the step function properties so we could remove the laser have more or less normal social interaction going on without the impediment of this hardware. And you know, you, you can have the same animal uh, here you'll, on the left is a movie uh, that will be uh, compared with what's going on uh, on the right. It's the same test animal in both cases, uh, seconds after a same sex juvenile has been introduced into the cage. But this is the normal behavior and that's the animal after the step function opsin has been activated shifting the balance. What you can see is in both cases, the larger animal rushes over to inspect the smaller juvenile. But after the first few seconds, uh, things look very different. Again, it's the same uh, uh, test animal in both cases, but what's going on here is it seems to be equally interested in the wall of the cage, uh, whereas here, 
again, the same animal, but not having had this balance shifted is actively exploring and engaging with the, the juvenile. And so this was a marked difference that was very consistent across uh, many uh, animals. We also saw an interesting physiological change. Uh, and this goes back to what we see clinically in, in patients, that there's an elevated uh, gamma power in the EEG. This is high frequency synchronized activity in the 30 uh, to 80 hertz or greater uh, range. And that's seen uh, in patients with autism. And so we were curious to know if that would show up here uh, as well in this context. And so this is a movie. Uh, what's going to happen here? It's a sped up movie. You'll see this mouse zipping around, but it's not really zipping around. It's sped up. Uh, but at 120 seconds, you can see the time here. That's when a brief flash of blue light will be given to activate this uh, step function opsin in the excitatory cells and shift this balance of excitation and inhibition. And uh, at 240 seconds, yellow light will come on to turn it off. And so you can focus your attention here in the so-called gamma band. You can see it's quite flat here at baseline. But you'll see 120 seconds, you can start to see this uh, uh, power appearing in this high frequency band. Now at 240 seconds, the yellow light comes on and that band uh, flattens out. And this was a consistent thing. It's playing again. Uh, 120 seconds, you see the gamma band showing up. And then at 240 seconds, uh, about now, it, uh, it, uh, it uh, disappears. And this was a consistent finding across uh, many animals. You see this blue light triggered appearance of this high gamma band and then this uh, yellow light termination of it. You can even see it here in the raw data compared to the uh, the uh, 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 control case. Uh, this social exploration deficit that was seen at the same time was not uh, uh, seen along with a novel object, a non-social task. These animals had normal uh, inspection of uh, objects. There seemed to be a, a, a change that was more specific to social interaction. So this was uh, uh, an, just an example of how opsin engineering, in this case, making these step function opsins allowed us to come to a causal physiology understanding of how uh, a particular kind of change might alter a complex behavior and uh, an interesting uh, kind of physiology. Of course, uh, it's only scratching the surface. There's a, a great deal uh, more to do before we understand uh, what's going on in something like uh, uh, social behavior dysfunction. Other kinds of engineering have to do with membrane trafficking. And so what we found is we can put opsins into cells, uh, but in many cases, uh, they won't go to the right place. They come from microbial or archaeal organisms that don't even have the same intracellular membrane compartments as mammalian cells. And so we've helped that issue uh, quite a bit. We've put uh, ER export motifs that help them get out of the ER. We've had trafficking sequences that we put in. We borrow these from mammalian potassium channels, and that helps them get out into the processes of the cell. And we can take things like a bacteriod opsin that is as in this YFP fusion protein you can see is forming these clumps and not even uh, really getting to the membrane very well. By adding these two motifs, we actually can create a very nice membrane localization of this bacteria rhodopsin, for example. And this sort of trafficking principle has helped all the opsins we've looked at, uh, pumps or channels. And that uh, allowed us to do the following kind of experiment. This is, again, another, just an example. I'm going to delve in greater detail into anxiety circuitry in a minute, but I just want to give some very short examples to highlight the value of uh, opsin engineering. By Enhancing, in this way, a chloride pump. This is a halo rhodopsin. That's what the HR means. This delivers chloride ions into cells and hyperpolarizes the uh, target neuron. This uh, membrane trafficking strategy, this third generation enhanced membrane trafficking opsin, allowed us to do, finally, a loss of function mammalian behavior. Notice this actually was three years after the 2007 uh, gain of function of mammalian behavior, which was the sleep-wake behavior I mentioned earlier. It took longer to get loss of function to happen because we had to figure out how to get these opsins to traffic uh, more effectively uh, in neurons. And uh, nevertheless, it did uh, finally work. And so what we did was target this halo rhodopsin to cholinergic neurons. Uh, and this was done by creating Cree-dependent uh, viral vectors 
that we could inject into Cree driver mice that expressed Cree recombinase only in particular kinds of cells. In this case, uh, uh, we then studied cocaine conditioning. Uh, and there had been a debate as to whether these particular cells, which are present in the nucleus accumbens, whether they favor or inhibit cocaine conditioning. And we were able to actually come in and, and uh, ask uh, this question and answer it, uh, at least in the, this particular setting. So we uh, brought in bilateral fiber optics to target the bilateral nucleus accumbens structures. We had the haloridopsin introduced into the cholinergic cells in the nucleus accumbens. And we used this conditioned place preference apparatus to uh, infer the animal's uh, uh, response to cocaine. Normally, an animal will prefer to spend time in a chamber where it previously received cocaine. Uh, this is, you know, who knows what the animal's actually feeling, but it's uh, probably good because it wants to be in that place where it previously experienced that. And that's not unlike what happens with uh, patients. Now, uh, this path tracing shows the animal prefers to spend time in that chamber. That's normal behavior. What's shown here, though, is a uh, litter mate where we've successfully inhibited the cholinergic cells in, in the nucleus accumbens. And this animal no longer uh, seems to care that it received cocaine in that chamber. It, it explores both chambers uh, equally. Uh, and this is not due to a more fundamental problem. We did control experiments to show that the animal can still form place memories and locomote normally and so on. Uh, but that was an interesting finding that we could uh, remove the uh, appetitive or, or positive conditioning uh, uh, value of cocaine, which is normally an extremely po uh, powerful uh, motivator. And also an answer this uh, question as to the causal role of these particular cells in this important process. Another kind of opsin engineering, in this case membrane trafficking, that allowed us to address a different kind of question. Yet another kind of engineering is speeding up the opsins. Uh, we've been able to address some artifactual issues. Uh, for example, sometimes we saw after a single light pulse, we would see two spikes, two action potentials instead of one. And uh, this was probably due to this prolonged depolarization that lasts about 10 or 20 milliseconds. This is due to that slow deactivation of channel rhodopsin after you turn off the light. But we mutated some other residues near the retinal, including this glutamate-123, and we found we could greatly uh, accelerate the uh, uh, deactivation of the opsin, this mutant that we call cheetah for fast deactivation, E123T or A mutant. And you go from having these multiplets of spikes to just a single spike, so one light pulse, one spike a higher fidelity uh, response. And we found we could have cells follow at 200 hertz or more uh, with high fidelity. Yet another kind of engineering. There's a whole host of other things I could share, uh, many different kinds of chimeras and other sorts of modifications. But I won't dwell too much on that uh, for the sake of time. But I'll just highlight that now we and many other laboratories are uh, identifying new opsins, engineering them. We uh, did a side-by-side -side comparison of many of these, and if you're interested in the details, uh, it's published in uh, Nature Methods. A final uh, point of engineering before we get it deeper into the uh, actual uh, anxiety application that I want to spend a little in-depth time on it has to do with mutating residues that are actually in the pore. Uh, so this is the pore, uh, and it's lined with charged and polar residues. You can see serine, threonine, lysine, glutamine. And we actually find that by mutating some of these residues in the pore, we can actually start to shift this from being a more or less non-selective cation channel to actually starting to favor potassium. And that could help us create an inhibitory channel, which doesn't exist yet and which could be very potent and valuable in optogenetic uh, work. Now, there's a huge diversity of opsins out there. They exist in all the major kingdoms of life. Uh, we've been uh, cloning many of them, engineering many of them. Um, what's an interesting opportunity is we can start to combine them with each other, make chimeras of one and another, and sometimes very interesting properties come out. For example, this is a multicellular green algae called Volvox carteri, and it makes its own channel red opsin that's red-shifted. This is so-called VCHR1. It's got this. Uh, red shifted action spectrum compared to the other opsin I've been showing you so far, channel opsin 2, which is more activated by blue light. 
Now that's interesting because it raises the possibility of having multiple uh, channel control in the same preparation, looking at combinatorial effects. The problem is the currents were quite small, not very effective. I won't dwell on details, but over a number of years, we increased the currents about tenfold with a host of molecular engineering and point mutants, creating this uh, uh, final opsin that we called C1V1. We could drive spikes with red light, finally. And this one actually turned out to be interesting. It, we could actually do combinatorial control, but also serendipitously, C1V1 is, seems particularly well suited to two photon excitation. Uh, now that has immense value for resolving and controlling single identified cells in intact tissue. The reduced light scattering that you are able to achieve with the long wavelength uh, infrared two photon illumination is very important uh, in helping along with other properties in achieving single cell uh, control in intact tissue. And what we found is using this we could control even within a living mouse that we could control a single neuron uh, to fire spikes. And that's illustrated here. We have a patch pipette not to stimulate but just to record so we know what's going on. It's filled with a red dye and we've got a cell attached patch on this single neuron in layer 2-3 of cortex of this living mouse. And C1V1, for reasons that we don't fully understand, but probably have to do with its high expression level, its red-shifted action spectrum, and aspects of its kinetics, uh, we found this works very well. We can scan, raster scan, the two-photon excitation just above the cell, and we don't see spiking. But then as we scan within the cell, we can see an elicited spike. And then as we go just below the cell, we no longer see spiking. So we have uh, single cell resolution. We can drive the cell, for example, at five hertz in this living uh, animal. Now, that's just one cell. Um, we're going to start to be playing in uh, more complex patterns of activity using uh, holographic techniques, for example, where we, you can actually impose three-dimensional structured patterns of light onto tissue and control uh, arbitrary, sparse, distributed, and asynchronous populations of cells. What has been most common, though, until now, has been simply bathing the target tissue in light and recruiting all of the targeted population um, more or less at once. That uh, still has been very valuable because finally we can at least resolve that population, even if other kinds of cells are intermixed and embedded uh, with in that uh, uh, target population. And so that is then what I'd like to spend a little more time on now is that principle and particularly focusing on the anxiety application. Now I mentioned this application before. This is the fiber optic uh, uh, interface that allows us to depth target a particular brain region for control. And we're now able to apply this to uh, a number of different kinds of motivated behaviors, uh, particularly in the last year or so. We've been looking at depression-related and anxiety-related uh, behavioral patterns. And I want to focus on uh, this paper, uh, assembling the different features of the anxious uh, state. Now, how do you study anxiety-related behaviors in animals? Um, this uh, is done by uh, a number of different kinds of assay. What's illustrated here is something called the elevated plus maze. This is a so-called closed arm, and this is an open arm. The closed arm has elevated walls, and you can see the animal normally prefers to spend almost all its time in the arm with elevated walls, the so-called closed arm. Uh, and when we start to drive a putative anxiolytic pathway, some blue letters will show up here that will indicate when we're starting to drive an anti-anxiety pathway. Uh, you'll see if the animal's behavior uh, starts to change. Now we're driving that anti-anxiety pathway. For the first time, the animal's willing to consider and actually act on going out into the open arms. It still explores uh, the whole maze but it's willing to consider, uh, it seems, the uh, open arms as uh, worthy of investigation as well. To make sure this is not just a habituation to the apparatus, we always have a third epoch where we turn off the light uh, 
after the light on episode and we see the animal's behavior uh, typically revert back to how it was uh, initially. Now, this is uh, apprehension in the absence of an immediate threat. So it's anxiety-like in that sense. We, this is a widely used test uh, uh, in the pharmaceutical industry and in academia. Uh, anxiolytics, anti-anxiety agents that work in people will shift this behavior in the uh, animal. Now, of course, this is only one aspect of anxiety. You know, we, anxiety is a very serious uh, clinical condition that uh, is incompletely treated, and it has not just risk avoidance features. If that's all it were, it would not be uh, nearly as uh, difficult and challenging uh, uh, and the source of so much morbidity as it, as it is. There's also, for example, uh, major physiological changes with anxiety, elevated heart rate, elevated respiratory rate, which are disruptive, and there's a profound negative valence. It doesn't feel good. It feels very, very bad to be severely anxious, and this can cause uh, very severe uh, issues in patients, including uh, suicide and uh, development of major depression. So those are different features of anxiety. There's risk avoidance, there's physiological changes, and then you have the subjective valence, which maybe is the most important uh, aspect of it. The elevated plus maze only looks at one feature of the anxious state, which is this risk avoidance. So we sought to explore how these different features might be coordinately uh, assembled, put together, brought on, and disassembled. Uh, and we looked around four different uh, uh, circuit elements that might subserve this uh, uh, interesting role. And we turned our attention to the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis, BNST. A very simplified cartoon is shown here. Uh, it ha has a very rich set of afferents coming in, a very rich set of efferents going out, uh, and only a tiny subset are shown here. It has a strong excitatory projection from the basolateral amygdala, and it has, among its many outputs, uh, interesting uh, outgoing projections to the ventral tegmental area where dopamine neurons reside that could subserve a role that relates to the subjective valence or subjective preference. It also has powerful projections to the lateral hypothalamus and to brainstem structures that are involved in respiratory uh, control, including the parabrachial nucleus. So we sought to study this with optogenetics. Now, the first thing we did was to make sure that in our hands the BNST uh, was relevant to anxiety, and so we used the elevated plus maze assay that I've shown you. Normally animals will prefer to spend time, the mice will spend nearly all their time in the closed arm of the maze. We found that when we infused in antagonists of excitatory activity into the BNST, we saw a more or less equal preference for the open and closed arms, suggestive of an anxiolytic effect and suggesting the BNST normally promotes an anxiety-like state because inhibiting it removes that uh, behavior. And that was a consistent finding across many animals. That was with a pharmacological approach. We saw a similar thing optogenetically when we introduced this third generation halorhodopsin I mentioned earlier to inhibit the BNST we saw increased open arm time consistent with an anxiolytic effect of inhibiting the BNST. Uh, no effect was seen when you just express a yellow fluorescent protein as the gray bars show. Now, that was actually known. That was not new. Uh, lesion studies uh, had explored the role of the BNST in the past. Uh, but now we had an opportunity to use optogenetics to actually resolve different projections and different substructures and understand these uh, uh, state assembly questions I mentioned earlier. The first thing we did was explore a little bit of this sub-complexities within the BNST. For example, there's this oval structure that we can see anatomically, but there's no way to resolve it with an electrode or a lesion. It's too small. But we found uh, serendipitously that we had a mouse Cree driver line that expressed only in the oval BNST, and this was a dopamine type 1 receptor uh, Cre driver line. And so we used our Cre dependent adeno associated viral vectors, injected them into the BNST so we could just drive an opsin expression in the oval and not in the rest. And so what we found in that case here, expressing the inhibitor just in the oval, 
we saw the same thing. So no surprises, it was still an anxiolytic effect, anti-anxiety effect to inhibit just the substructure of the BNST. Okay, now we also looked at some physiological changes we saw along with the increased risk tolerance, there was actually a decreased respiratory rate consistent with this overall anxiolytic state recruitment. And that was just with inhibiting the oval nucleus of the BNST. Now, what about the rest? Well, we found we could selectively drive uh, or inhibit the uh, so-called anterodorsal BNST, the non-oval parts, the AD BNST, by driving this excitatory or, in, or inhibiting this excitatory projection from the BLA, which spares the oval, does not project to the oval, but does uh, project to the rest of the BNST. And here, we're able to use the projection targeting uh, aspect of microbial ops and based optogenetics. We can recruit a cell for control by virtue of its connectivity. And we do that by introducing the opsin by a virus into one brain region, but then delivering the fiber optic to deliver light in another brain region. And this works because of the enhanced trafficking properties of the opsins. They get shipped down the axon, even though they're made in the cell body here. And so you can actually turn up or down the cells defined by projections with this distal site of illumination with a fiber optic. And so we did that, we came in and inhibited cells that live here and project to here and asked what effect that had on the anxiety phenotype. And there, surprisingly, here we're sparing the oval, but just driving or inhibiting, in this case inhibiting, the projection from BLA to anterodorsal BNST, we saw a decrease in the open arm time of the animal. So this was actually an anxiogenic effect. So this suggested that these two subnuclei of the BNST had oppositional effects, one normally increasing the anxiety-like behavior and one decreasing it, and they existed in uh, opposition. This was not something that you could have resolved uh, uh, by an electrode or lesion. Then we asked, since so many interesting projections seem to come anatomically from the anterodorsal BNST, we then followed up this projection targeting concept, now delivering opsins into the BNST and then delivering light by fiber optic to different downstream structures to see what kinds of behaviors might <coughs> result. By the way, uh, the respiratory effect uh, had the uh, expected opposite uh, effect uh, as well. When we inhibited the anterodorsal BNST, we actually saw an increase in respiratory rate consistent with this anxiogenic uh, phenotype that would be predicted. Okay, so then how are these different features uh, separably created and recruited? Now here, we brought to bear an excitatory opsin, channel rod opsin, to drive these outgoing uh, projections. And here we used projection targeting uh, by various means. Um, just to show you uh, what happens when you deliver an excitatory opsin into the basolateral amygdala, but deliver light into the BNST, we saw when you drive that excitatory projection, you do see increased open arm time consistent with an anxiolytic phenotype. These animals are expressing less behavioral anxiety. And when you drive that projection, you see decreased respiratory rate, again, consistent with uh, decreased anxiety-like state. This is the place preference test. Now, this starts to get interesting. The, I showed you the place preference test with regard to the cocaine experiment before. And what was very interesting was that we found that even though there was a behavioral change, the animal was willing to spend more time in the open arms, this risky environment, and it had this physiological change, the animal didn't particularly seem to care that this was happening. There was not a subjective preference, at least that we could pick up by conditioning for where it had received this sort of stimulation. Kind of interesting that it didn't create that, that conditioning uh, 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 value for the animal. Now we then delved deeper into the outgoing projections from the BNST. We delivered the opsin into the BNST and then delivered a fiber optic to the lateral hypothalamus. And there we saw something very interesting. 
we saw the full recruitment of this anxiolytic behavioral risk avoidance feature, but we saw absolutely no detectable respiratory rate change. So it was as if we were just picking up one feature of the behavioral state and no subjective preference, at least as picked up by place preference conditioning. So that was this one. We de delivered ops in here and delivered light to lateral hypothalamus and saw only the risk avoidance feature of the state. Then, looking at some other outgoing projections, we delivered ops into the BNST and delivered light into the parabrachial nucleus. And there, we saw no behavioral effect on risk avoidance, but we did see the anxiolytic type respiratory rate change, decreased respiratory rate. But again, the animal didn't seem to particularly care that that was happening. There was no uh, preference that the animal uh, exhibited. Finally, we introduced opsin into the BNST and delivered light to the ventral tegmental area, site of dopamine neurons, and we thought this might be interesting. But we saw no detectable risk avoidance behavior, no detectable respiratory rate change. But finally, here, for the first time, the animal cared that it was happening. It seemed to like it. It spent more time, a lot more time, in the chamber where we were driving the projection from BNST to the VTA. Even though there was no risk avoidance uh, effect, the animals seemed to be experiencing, or at least they reported, a preference uh, for having received this drive. So each of these different outgoing projections seem to be able to recruit a different feature associated with the anxiolytic uh, state. Now that raised other interesting circuit level questions. How are these different features of this uh, change in anxiety state coordinated? Uh, it was a little mysterious because this was thought to be a largely inhibitory structure. And uh, we thought one way this could happen though would be uh, if there were excitatory recurrence within this structure that might coordinate the uh, more or less coherent recruitment of the different cells with different outgoing projections. And we do think that's going on, actually, or something like it. We found that after a burst of blue light pulses here in vivo, but also in vitro in isolated slices, that after you terminate an excitatory drive to the BNST, you can see persistent activity outlasting by some tens of seconds in a significant fraction of the neurons that are recorded from electrically. Uh, now that is in vivo, so anything could be going on, but then we saw a very similar thing when we cut acute slices from the BNST and studied this in isolation. A single electrical shock to the anterodorsal BNST gave uh, activity that was persistent, measured as a, using a calcium indicator or in green, organ green BAPTA, lasting again for tens of seconds after a single shock, and that was blocked by glutamate receptor antagonists. So we do think there is uh, some kind of local excitatory recurrence that might help coordinate these different uh, cells with different outgoing projection targets. So that illustrates how uh, different uh, features might be uh, uh, recruited. Uh, this kind of paradigm where you record uh, during behavior, where you stimulate cells defined by projection, and uh, you uh, are carrying out a region-specific uh, modulation is something that might be uh, generalizable. Now, for the sake of time, uh, there is a whole other thing I could talk about with regard to depression, but I think uh, I could save time uh, instead to take uh, uh, questions. Um, and so maybe I'll just uh, uh, do that. I do want to, <laughs> unless there's an objection. Um, and if there's, if there's still time, we can actually circle back and do more of this later. Um, uh, is that OK? I don't know how much time we have. Is that OK? OK. So uh, what I'll do is, is just wrap up there. I do want to take a, 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 a moment to thank our, our many outstanding uh, students and colleagues uh, uh, who are illustrated here. I want to highlight the people whose work I, I spent most time on. Um, on the anxiety work that I've just finished delving into in detail, in, delving into in detail Sungyeon Kim, uh, a graduate student in the lab uh, led that work in combination with uh, Avishek uh, Adhikari, a postdoctoral fellow. The clarity work led by Kwang Hoon Chung in the lab uh, and Viviana Gradnaru. Uh, Kwang Hoon's now an assistant professor at MIT and Viviana uh, at Caltech. And uh, our many uh, 
colleagues here uh, who uh, are uh, in many ways uh, important for the work. I want to highlight Peter Hegemann, uh, one of our collaborators who's worked with us on some of the ops and engineering, and Osamu Nareki, our crystallography uh, collaborator, uh, who uh, has done a lot of work with us and continues to do work. We're trying to get additional uh, crystal structures to help further elucidate how these opsins work. Um, and then I uh, want to thank our funding agencies and uh, our wonderful uh, staff as well as our students. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carl, for that wonderful uh, dissertation. Uh, I'm sure there are lots and lots of questions that uh, people want to ask. Uh, I, because I'm chairing this, I'm going to be uh, first. And I'm, uh, the obvious question is, uh, is it possible uh, in a therapeutic sense to ever deliver this in humans? So uh, we are uh, not uh, really uh, trying very hard to introduce these into human central nervous system. We have a, I have some concerns that it might uh, cause some problems. Uh, you know, these are foreign genes that you know come from algae. You know, they may uh, elicit uh, uh, reactions of various kinds that even at, at a low incidence might be problematic. That said, uh, I think there are opportunities uh, for uh, human health. Uh, first of all, just deeper understanding will allow us to, you know, for example, if we identify a projection that's causally involved, that we know is causally involved in a important behavioral state, uh, we can then screen for drugs that uh, are targeted to proteins that are expressed in that projection. Uh, uh, we could design better brain stimulation treatments that might be electrical or magnetic that are better targeted to locations where that projection is resolved. And so I think uh, you know, the, the fundamentals of understanding and opening the door to any kind of treatment are the most important uh, uh, outcomes. OK, I'll take uh, other questions. Steve, yeah. So to do a follow-on from that. We need to, I must, because this is streaming worldwide, uh, <laughs> microphone essential. Just as a follow-up on that concept, um, what are the ethical issues that are going to arise when you can assemble and disassemble there's, you know, there's behavior dis you know, disorders, but you know, I want to, my wife would want to improve my personality, for instance. Um, and where do you draw the line, and when do you start to consider those um, for this type of technology? Yeah, the ethical issues we have to stay on top of. Uh, you know, the, I think you could always say, well, these, these issues have always existed. We can already tune our personalities with pharmacology, with you know, behavioral therapies, et cetera. But there is a special concern that, that arises once you get to this level of specificity, I think. Then it, then it uh, you know, you know we're, we're limited in how much caffeine we can take in by various practical limitations. Um, but you might not have such limitations with uh, a sufficiently advanced and precise interventional technology. So it's, it's important to think about. Um, you know, it's, it's not something that could be easily um, uh, abused, I think, in the sense that medications could be abused. In, in my view, actually, the most interesting uh, ethical issues are sort of philosophical. Uh, uh, you know, if, what, what does it mean that we can, you know, instruct an animal what it wants and how much it wants of that? Uh, you know, what does that say about free will and things like that? This is, these are important things to think about. But to be honest, in terms of, of pressing day-to-day -day issues, I think we're, we're ways out before we run into real ethical trouble. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I've got two questions. First of all, how many hours of sleep do you get a night? <laughs> uh, well, last night, zero. <laughs> and second of all, I was just wondering, just for young scientists, have you got any sort of recipes for coming up with big ideas? Because you've obviously come up <laughs> with some big ones. Uh, that's, that is a very interesting question. Um, what I've tried to do, uh, I think I do two things that might be helpful here. One is uh, I, I try to have a 
each person and also the lab have a, 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 a sort of a diverse, diversified portfolio. So everybody has a high risk and a low risk project. And well, actually what I find is that the so-called high risk and low risk projects actually work out at about the same rate, which shows that we can't really predict <laughs> very well what happens. But at least people have uh, you know, something that's safer and something that's, that's riskier. And that's important just in taking care of people's careers, and, but also for, for making sure that steady progress happens in the lab, which is good for morale. But I think the most important thing is, is, uh, is uh, bringing together people who, who come from uh, very different disciplines. And we have consistently tried to do that, and it's consistently difficult. It's awkward. Uh, People don't know why, you know, when I, when I started the, building these, uh, these hydrogels and, you know, and, and the keratin and chitin thing, people thought it was completely insane. It made no sense, and it was so different from anything that had gone on in the lab to that point. But uh, it, you just need uh, to bring people together who are willing to talk to each other to facilitate the uh, communication to get through the awkward, you know, first... Uh, days or, or, or weeks. Um, and, and so a little bit of what I do is, is a little bit like sort of group therapy and helping people to, to, to get through those, <laughs> those awkward <laughs> moments. Um, so I think patience and, and willing to tolerate and, and seeking out those, those awkward conversations is important. I'll take a, two more questions, yes. Um, mine's a, a technical question uh, about the, uh, the clarity method. Uh, and you mentioned the phospholipid membranes and the addition of the lipases were very useful in, in clarifying the tissue. I was wondering if you considered also using other um, enzymes, sphingomyelinases, and maybe an enzyme cocktail that would break down the glycosphingolipids, and perhaps some of your colleagues who have so far shown less than perfect clarity maybe that would help them um, get something that's, that's truly clear. Yeah, actually, this, uh, we just talked about this. Uh, uh, we, just upstairs, I suggested that what we found in the last uh, uh, couple weeks is that uh, when we include a, a protease, uh, proteinase K, in the, in the mix, that actually greatly uh, accelerates the uh, antibody staining. Um, uh, that is carried out subsequently. This has been the, the most difficult thing. You know, we, the antibody staining for an intact uh, brain uh, takes uh, really months, uh, and that's that's a little too slow to be practical. It, you know, it, it, even at the, the best case, it takes probably six to eight weeks. And so we were working on ways to accelerate that, and and nothing was really working. We were trying. Uh, electrophoretic enhancement of antibody penetration and so on. Nothing really worked. We finally hit on a combination of a couple things. One is uh, a, a brief uh, proteinase K treatment and also uh, reducing the cross-linking extent by dropping the uh, bisacrylamide uh, concentration. But I think it could be further enhanced with other uh, sorts of, uh, of, of uh, enzymatic uh, treatment. Uh, and of course, there's always the trade-off of, of what are you gonna lose as a result. Okay, Fred, last question. Uh, the beautiful set of experiments you've shown us. Um, are you able to provide uh, multiple inputs to one group of neurons because that's what they're sitting at in the brain? And uh, along the same line, uh, you can you change frequency because uh, that may be an important coding message in, in inputs? Yeah, so we, here's where the, I'll tackle the second one first. The frequency is actually uh, tractable. Uh, that's one of the main, I think, advantages of the fast opsins is you can, you know, play in activity of a precise frequency. Um, in our work with, uh, I didn't show it here, but for example, we looked at, uh, you know, the conditioning value of driving different frequencies of uh, dopamine neuron activity. And we found the same number of action potentials delivered at one hertz was not appetitive, did not positively condition, but the same number at a higher frequency 
uh, was appetitive. And so frequency is crucial, and, and you wouldn't know that with a slower method. Likewise, with a deep brain stimulation set of experiments, we found completely different or even oppositional results depending on the frequency that we played in. So that, that, that you can do. Uh, the more complex question is your first one. How do you, you know, uh, for a particular cell population, how do you play in different kinds of uh, inputs? Uh, and here's where having multiple different options is of value. In collaboration with uh, John Huguenard's group at Stanford, we actually achieved something like that by doing simultaneous two afferent projection targeting into one downstream target nucleus. So we were looking at a corticothalamic and a thalamothalamic projection into a particular uh, thalamic nucleus. And we had a C1V1 and channel red opsin, a yellow light activated and a blue light activated opsin that was in different projections converging on a target cell population. And we found that the relative timing of these two different incoming projections was crucial in determining whether or not a spike would uh, be elicited in the target cell. Now that's just two populations. Of course, there are you know, many more complexities we'd like to get to, but at least the proof of principle uh, was there. Well, uh, thanks very much, Carl. I'm now going to ask Mr. Martin Meyer to say a few words and more importantly, prevent, uh, present the uh, Kenneth Meyer Medal. Well, distinguished guests, scientists, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Flory Neuroscience, sorry, Institute of Neuroscience and Mental Health, it's my great pleasure to thank Professor Carl Dizeroff for taking the time out on his very, very busy schedule to come down to Melbourne to deliver the 17th Kenneth Meyer Lecture. As you know, the optical deconstruction of fully assembled biological systems. As you've heard, my name's Martin Meyer and I'm the proud son of Kenneth Meyer, who with Derek Denton, Ian Potter, and many others, my father spent 30 years helping establish the Howard Floor Institute before tragically passing away in 1992. This lecture series in my father's name was established by the Flory shortly after his death with a gift from his estate. And the purpose of this gift was, and still is, to, bring, to attract to Australia some of the world's most outstanding scientists. And in doing, so, in doing so, give the Flory and the wider science communities and the general public and exposure to a level of intellectual dis discourse that's not always available in Australia. With his lecture today, Professor Dizeroff has joined an esteemed alumni of Kenneth Meyer lecturers, including, amongst others, James Watson, Eric Kandel, Sherwood Rowland, Colin Blakemore, and Peter Agre. Many of our lecturers are Nobel Prize winners, and not surprisingly, given the focus of the Flory, most of them have been neuroscientists. And this year's lecturer is no exception. And Professor Dizeroff's very scientifically detailed lecture neatly contrasts last year's lecturer, Bill Bryson, one of the world's great lay communicators on science and his talk on the short history of the universe and nearly everything in it. My father was passionate about science and technology and what these two fields could do for the future benefit of mankind and his decades-long support of many scientific fields was justly rewarded by him being ma made one of the few lay people to be made a fellow of the Australian Academy of Science. Ken was absolutely thrilled with this award. My father would have been delighted with Professor Dizeroff's optogenetics technique, techniques with its power to study the brain in the finest detail in conscious animals who are free to move about. This would have reminded him very much of Derek Denton's techniques of infusing various solutions into the brains of conscious and happy sheep, used extensively here at the Flory 40 years ago. I'm pleased to learn today that Steve Petru and his team here at the Flory have been working for some time to introduce optogenetics techniques to the work here. And I'm particularly personally excited about its application in the study of anxiety and its potential impact on depression. I'd like to hear more about that perhaps over dinner. More than that, I'm very pleased that in fact, 
Carl, you are the youngest lecturer we've ever had. And I think the earlier question about how do you, the young scientists come up with big ideas is a critical one. Because what you're looking at is the work of Carl's first decade since setting up his laboratory. I wonder what's going to happen in the next decade. So I'd like to comment very briefly on three themes that to me emerge from Professor Dizeroff's very successful career so far, all of which are relevant to the Flory, medical research in general, and in particular, our chief medical research funding body, the NHMRC. One, and you've heard this from Carl, the benefits of cross-disciplinary teams. Professor Dizeroff's teams include computational neuroscientists, medics, chemists, and engineers. And the revolutionary nature of both techniques, optogenetics and clarity, probably owe their existence to the cross-disciplinarity of his teams. I'm pleased to learn that the Flory has many multidisciplinary teams, with, for example, Steve Petru's epilepsy and David Howe's stroke divisions, which include clinicians, geneticists, statisticians, physicists, neural engineers alongside the scientists. Two, the benefits of medically trained scientists. In Professor Dizeroff's case, this is particularly powerful with respect to neuroscience because he is also a practicing psychiatrist. This not only prompted him to get into the research in the first place, but allows him to bring valuable insights to the research. Such medically trained scientists have long been sought after by the Flory. And again, I'm very pleased to learn today that nearly a third of the Flory scientists are clinically trained. My guess is that even more would be better, both here, perhaps in Australia, and of course around the world, and perhaps this should be a special focus of philanthropy. And finally, three, the benefits of fielding, uh, research funding for left field ideas. In Professor Dizeroff's case, the funding of the research the development of a technology itself rather than the exploration of a particular hypothesis. This is a lesson that our NHMRC could well benefit from absorbing. One recent example I learnt of is their reluctance to fund the longitudinal cohort studies such as the ABLE study here in Melbourne, which is tracking a group of healthy ageing people with a view to understanding much more about the development and possible treatment of Alzheimer's disease. One only has to recall the impact of the 65-year-long year Framingham study on the treatment of cardiovascular disease to realise the importance of these types of studies. As many of you will know from my comments at previous lectures, over the past decade, the Howard Florey has evolved into the Florey Institute of Neuroscience and Mental Health, one of the world's largest centres of neuroscience. From 1992 until 2009, I had the particular privilege of serving on the board of the Flory and adding my contribution to that transition. I'm now pleased to say the process is complete with the merger of four smaller neuroscience institutes and the co-location of these with the University of Melbourne's neuroscientists. As part of this merger, two new research buildings are being completed, one on the Austin Hospital campus focused on clinical research and this one here on the University of Melbourne's Parkville campus, focused on basic research. An additional clinical research centre has been completed in collaboration with the University and Melbourne Health at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. I and my family are greatly honoured that the University chose to name this building after my father, Ken. I was equally pleased to be able this afternoon to attend the naming of this auditorium in honour of Sir Ian Potter, my father's partnering partner in helping Derek Denton establish the Flory in 1960. These developments at the Flory would certainly have pleased my father. He was, a passion, he was passionate about medical research, although his point of view was always that of a scientifically unsophisticated lay person. What kept his attention and enthusiasm for so many decades was the excitement of new discoveries and the belief that these could make a difference to the health and well-being of the community. There is no doubt that he would have been thrilled by Professor de Zeroff's lecture this evening. Would you please now join me in thanking Professor de Zeroff for his entertaining and engaging lecture.
now my very great pleasure to ask Carl to come forward and receive his medallion in commemoration of his delivery of the 17th Kenneth Meyer Lecture. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this concludes tonight's proceedings. On behalf of the Florey Institute of Neuroscience and Mental Health, I thank you for coming and look forward to seeing you at the next lecture. Good evening. Yeah.